first one, I didn't get much, but I was just talking about. So how does email is applied or how does email? No, but first, first, please tell us, tell us who you are. I think oh, some people know you, yeah. but not everyone knows you. So sorry about that. Uh, so I am Nabil Said. I am uh, Illuminatis. Um, I am Bach Street Trainee of Ten Academy, and I work with Nathanan and other like, five Bach Street Trainee graduates with Yabi at in Adulio. So we're there as a data scientist slash email loops. Um, so yeah, pretty much that's it. At home, are you going or? So shall I go or? Yeah. I think we can hear your answer, then I can go about introducing myself with the answer. Yeah, OK. So how does email loops turn into business? Um, so I'm going to talk about this answer this in a way that how I don't deal with machine learning and change that into business because as you know, um, I go to college with most of you and you know, I don't have that much big experience. So I'm just going to answer it. How does Adolio use machine learning uh, to facilitate its business? So Adolio is an ad service, ad serving company and uh, there's concept called real-time bidding. So that is um so, so we have an inventory inventory the sites and advertise or ads are shown in the sites or in our mobile so that's an inventory and so we bought those inventories and we show the ads and when users engage with those ads we get paid right so how do we optimize this and get more money um more inventories so First, email loops help us to optimize this. There's a bidding algorithm that optimize uh, how to, or optimize our price on buying inventories. So less money, we get more inventory. Or how can we get more inventory with less money? So that's one way how uh, machine learning help us to optimize and get more value with less money. Um, then the, the second is, when users engage with those ads, we get paid, right? So how do we get more users that engage so that we get paid more? So also machine learning, the bidding algorithm help us to get more uh, users or show ads with, for users that engage more so that we get paid a lot. So, yeah. With where, does many, ML ops fit into, where does MLOps fit into this? MLOps. Um, so, in bidding algo, it's more like email engineering, but in email logs, in our company, let's, so I'm working on a reporting and it's more on data engineering and email logs. So, there is our data and we build the ETL pipeline that will transform the data and make it in a, a reportable format. So, we serve that uh, data for clients that can be uh, outside clients or inside clients, right? So, and we serve that data um, through websites, mostly websites, well, yeah, but mostly it's websites. Um, so in fact, I have some slides, uh, kind of, it's possible you, to share. You can present, yeah, yeah, you can present. I think it's turned on. Yeah. Yeah, um, these are the slides I prepared some time ago. And like, this is the architecture of what I'm doing right now. And it's reporting engine or reporting platform. So uh, we have the data, but first let me talk about the data pipeline, right? So as I said, we have an advertisement company and all the data comes from the ads. So most of you, I suppose you know JavaScript and JavaScript have these events whenever a user engage on click, on hold, whatever. 
So we have our own custom events, and all those events are tracked and stored in our S3 buckets. Um, so from this S3 bucket, we have a, a big data and just petabyte of data. It's a huge data, and um, nobody can, normal user can just play with it. It has to be formatted and served in a right way, in an efficient way. Um, so, and we have the reporting pipeline, this ETL pipeline. And what you get from these three buckets, that's transformed and cached. And I forget about this one. Oh, let me delete that one. Um, and so after it's cached, we have the reporting, whether it's on database or in CSV file, whatever format you want, you cache it. Well, then let me go back to this one. And uh, we have cached it, we have the cache file here, we have the, we cached it in the database. And we create or we fetch that cache data from the database through uh, API. We usually use Flask API because Python is easier to implement uh, ML models. Uh, it's easier to do or use Panda and transform the data and a lot of other benefits. So we have the API, Flask API endpoint. Then we have some front end framework here and those to com com communicate. And we serve this uh, report to the clients. And mostly on the front end, we use React. Um, so, yeah. And from like this diagram, I put ML ops into this one, like this three. The DIT, the backend, and the database. And those are mostly the dev work. But ML ops is exactly that. You have your data science services, mostly the agents, not just models. That, that might, there might be another service you give as a data scientist. Then, like you have to present uh, or give your work to clients in some way, and mostly that's through websites. And the work beyond that is the uh, development or the ops, whatever you call it. So, like this is the ML ops mostly for me. So, yeah. Could you say something about your second slide, the data engineering slide? Because we have a number of people who want to go on to be data engineers. Um, so oh. it seems, I mean, this is sort of one whole career on one slide. So this creating a pipeline, you kind of have one arrow. So it seems, looks pretty easy to just draw an arrow. Um, yeah. But there's thousands of jobs open in this field. So why is that arrow so hard to draw? Uh, for me, it's just an arrow. An arrow but Okay, so ML. <laughs> okay, that's easy. Um, ML, ML, data engineering. So data engineering. What's different? What what makes it different from ML engineering and ML ops? So ML engineering, you all know, you have these machine learning libraries and you apply them, then get good models, whether it's prediction, recommendation, optimization, whatever. And so there you need to have some level of mathematics and statistics knowledge. And it's preferable to have those knowledge. So for, but for those people who are more onto engineering, on software engineering, and doesn't have a strong background in statistics, data engineering is more for you, I, I, I suppose. But data engineering is more close to software engineering um, it deals with database mostly and some transformation pipeline and that's just engineering pipeline. So here, um, so mostly data engineering deals with like huge data and that can't usually be done on your local computer. You have to have these machines, AWS or Azure and those cloud machines. And there are uh, some libraries, not libraries, framework, I suppose, that can efficiently uh, transform your data into whatever format you want. So basically, you have a huge data, huge raw data. The format is not uniform. It comes from everywhere. And you have to like make it 
into a format you want that's easily usable. So for me, data engineering is just a huge data. You transform it and you make it, you move it into the structure you want, you want it to be, then you um, serve it. But in that process, there are a lot of techniques. You have to make it optimal, uh, efficient. Otherwise, it will take a lot of time, it will take days to process just a day data. So let's say for one day, we get some amount of data and that might take a lot of time to process unless you make it optimized. And there are tools like Spark to do that and how to store it, I guess. I don't know much about it, but yeah, uh, that's it. I guess the more you ask me, the more clear answer I can give. Okay, there's a sp yeah. Rachel has a question in the chat box um, to you. Can't stop. Okay, hi Rachel. How do you apply email logs in that table for your presentation? Um, let me present again. Um, so also this one I haven't, I didn't explain it, but I'll come back with the, to that. So here, the ML loops mostly involve in the front-end development, the back-end development, and the database. Because this one are data engineering mostly, some parts of the database and uh, reporting pipeline, that's basically ETL. I don't know if you guys have done ETL pipeline, but that's you fetch the data, you transform it, and you cache it. And, and the purpose you cache it is you can serve a huge data directly. One, the structure is not uniform. Two, it's a lot. It's going to take a lot of time to load. For instance, when a user uh, is using your website, you your website, you want it to be snappy and quick. So you can achieve that with a big data. You have to transform it into something that's less and can be fetched quickly. So those are the two reasons I see why I need to cache the values or the data. Um, so, but the email loops comes here. Some part of the database, back in development and front end development. And it's just, MLOps is just serving your service as a data scientist, serving your service to the client. And yeah. And it can mean a lot of other things like deploying these models and monitoring it. Monitoring it. And whenever there is a new insight or data, you update the models and it goes back and forth. That's, that's also MLOps, but on my case, on what I did, this is what MLOps is. Stashi or Stella? Yeah, uh, I just want to ask about this data that you're sending to the database. Is it data that you've cleaned? Or, uh, so for example, you remove the, the nuns and everything, or you leave them in there and it's just another type of transformation that you do? Yeah, I mean, it's, it should be cleaned and should be, like, yeah, everything it should be cleared otherwise. So, Usually, how it works is you have the, this data in the database and you fetch it and usually you present it to clients. You don't do some sanitize checking or remove unwanted values. What is in the database usually, or on what I do, usually should have, uh, should be clean and should be representable. So I need to do that in the ETL. So I cleaned everything. Make, make sure everything is correct, the values are correct, and then I store it in the database. Yeah, and it's clean. clean. Please? Uh, so my question comes in in the fact that uh, I do assume you want to work with real-time data. And in this case, what are some of the challenges you probably have to face in one, uh, ensuring that your model is served with real-time data and also like ensuring the model is dynamic enough to accept like changes in the data and also still remain high performing in this case. Yeah, so real time data. Um, so as I said, 
Um, so that's not the area I usually, usually involved on, but I, my colleagues does that, and uh, there's something you guys also know, I, just, I suppose. So ML flow, I guess, yeah, ML flow, and it automates model creation and model updating, and just one thing. But to answer your question, in my perspective, in like ML ops and data engineering perspective, so the data comes every time or whenever a user engages, the data comes, and um, I have the ETL and I have the reporting front end. So the ETL runs in a cron job. If you guys know what cron job is, if you don't know, so it's basically um, you say, you write the script, but it can be Python scripts, and you set it up for it to, to, to run every two hours or every three hours, whatever time range you want. So you, you set it up as that, and it runs uh, by that time interval. So whenever a new data comes, it faces that, it updates your uh, database, then it sleeps, like mine runs every four hours, I guess, and every other four hours, it faces the data, it updates the database. So whenever a client comes, when it sees a report, uh, it is like mostly updated or updated every four hours. So, yeah, I don't know if that's answering your question, but. Yeah, at least it gives me a basic understanding of what happens. Yeah. So, Nabil, there's, I don't know if <laughs> people are asking lots of questions. There's two in the chat box from Daniel and from Stella and Deborah. Yeah, Nahoma has just arrived here. <laughs> uh, okay, so Daniel is a lot. Fun fact, uh, I did my like graduation project to Daniel Zalala and Zalala Gatenet in the last and all. I don't know if there, if there are here. Uh, is there a specific tool that you use for sort of building data engineering pipeline or do you write the pipeline using some Python libraries by yourself? So I don't think I use um, any specific tool, to the usuals. Panda, NumPy, and yeah, those are like the usual ones, but other than that, and there's also the, this um, pipeline, not pipeline, this uh, data engineering library that yeah, we wrote. So I use that because that's mandatory, right? that's a necessary one. But other than that, we don't use these specific libraries. We write everything ourselves from scratch. Uh, what if a user wants to analyze the information you removed while cleaning? Does that even happen? Um, uh, the information you removed while cleaning. Um, so I removed the data for the purpose of reporting, right? And you remove the ones that are maybe, yeah, uh, I guess. They will have to go back and get that original data. Otherwise, if they want to analyze that remove data, they can get it. And the reason I remove it is to report it. And usually, when you report, there is specific analysis you do, and you show those analysis mostly in graph or row numbers, row format. But other than that, like there is no more exploration then, and you know, model building. So. You're just reporting. How long did it take you to comfortable in the role you are hired in? How long that? Yeah, okay. So how long did it take me? Um, <laughs> it's laughing at me. Anyways, how long? So as I, if I remember correctly, the first two weeks we go in and like we are making ourselves comfortable with the environment, with the work, with everyone that work in the uh, company. So the result, we, give, we have given some exploration tasks, that's like half a week, I guess. Then after that, I get the current task, and that's like three weeks or four weeks after I joined Adrugio. 
and within three weeks or four weeks i deliver my first release i think yeah or half, a month and a half so i would say three weeks to know everything and to make myself comfortable with the working environment Deborah, and the challenge you faced the challenge i faced so it's a new environment so it's challenging you have to know everything like you have to know the libraries you have to know everyone who, know, who does what so like getting or knowing that is challenging i guess and it's just a matter of time and after some time you know everyone you get comfortable with the environment and everything will be okay how, how was like when when i start working how was it like it was like so i uh, graduate i get the job after immediately i graduate from university so that's there was so much ex, ex, uh, excitement so joy and i didn't suffer a lot to get my first job so i was happy that was what i what it was like in terms of challenge and getting used to the world of work um, oh I totally answered that in a different perspective, but in terms of challenge and getting used to the work of the world of work. So I guess for us, for me specifically, let's let's answer this for me. It was not that challenging because um, I, I work with Yabi and he he was always there to mon uh, mentor us, to help us in our of need. So yeah, it was not such challenging because Yabi was around. Yeah, so that's it. I hope Nahomi is here and he can take the stage. Right. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone. And uh, thank you Nabil for giving me the stage. And so um, shall I start with the question Arun initially asked or? Yeah, please. So we'd like to know who, who are you other than uh, best answer from batch three. Um, a little bit about yourself, what you're doing, and then, yeah, really in specifics, what are you doing? And then I think there's lots of questions from different trainees. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us here. I'm really glad I had the chance to join you. So I'm also a batch three trainee uh, at 10 Academy. Uh, last year, I had the chance to meet this wonderful family. So um, I'm now a data scientist and developer. It's a kind of hybrid role that I'm taking in at Adludio. So uh, at first, I started off as a data scientist and slightly shifted towards a more development intensive role. So uh, I think that's about me. And uh, I think Arun initially asked us about how we can provide value for a company as a data scientist. And I, I believe that's, um, I mean, that uh, our value as a data scientist is what interests you, what interests you more, I believe. So I think it comes down to two things. The first one, we, as a data scientist, we can provide direct value in which uh, my colleagues, Natanan and Rahel, both batch three trainees as well are doing. And there is this indirect value that we can provide as well. So to be more specific, the direct value is, as Nabil mentioned, there is this real time bidding in which we'll have to optimize around the budget that we should spend. So in that, Rahel and Natanan are working with improving the algorithm so that we can come up with the most um, optimized budget. So from that, they're providing value directly. And Nabil and I are more of providing indirect value. Uh, to be more specific, for example, I'm working in analyzing users' behavior in the past. So the way users interacted with our advertisements and, you know, 
which kinds of adver advertisements suit which kind of individuals best. So these kinds of things are hard to measure. Even if we provide value, it's hard to measure and we provide it in such a, an indirect way. So uh, I think uh, MLOps fits in all of this because wherever, wherever there is development of something, there needs to be a continuous integration. So uh, I think Rahel is working on that side for, um, is handling that side for us. So uh, I think yeah, that's how we uh, provide value. That answers the question. And what do you do now? Yeah, so like I said, I, so we, Adludio is an advertisement company and uh, it's not just an ordinary advertisement that we provide. So we have this um, different types of advertisements where we engage not only the ears and eyes of uh, the individuals, but also their hands and fingers. That's uh, how our former CEO likes to put it. So here we have different kinds of engagements. So we, we might shake the mobile device so that we can uh, trigger some effect on the advertisement. And uh, from that, we have a lot of data. So each and every interaction with the advertisement is recorded. So from that, I come up with a data that can be utilized, utilized so that when designers come up with creatives in the future, by creatives, I mean advertisements in the future, they come up with the best ones that are tailored to the specific individuals that are targeted by the uh, campaign managers, which are actually the ones who decide where the ad should go. So I collect data and I pre-process it because the data that we are provided by the third party service providers, in our case, they're called the trade desk. And that data that comes from them is not meant to be used in such a way. So here comes data engineering. So I'll have to process the data in such a way that it can be utilized to inform designers to come up with better creatives that are uh, tailored towards the individuals they are targeting. So. I have data engineering and after data engineering is completed, I, uh, I had to improve on an algorithm that was already there. And uh, so that algorithm tries to use that data and gives so many different kinds of uh, suggestions that designers can use. Uh, I cannot get into the specifics, but yeah. It looks like that. So you mentioned something interesting. You said that you're maintaining algorithms or working on improving what other people have done. Um, yes. Do you, when were you thrown into designing something new that you had to design from scratch? And maybe this is a question to both Nabil and Noel. Um, and there's also three questions in the chat box. So whenever you guys want, that's now four. So my question, then you can take the, the four of them in the chat box. Okay, great. So I think uh, the project was already started uh, when I joined at Ludio, but unfortunately, I didn't have the luxury of someone explaining to me the um, project. That's partly because uh, my boss, uh, I mean, the my superior who was working on the project uh, only had a couple of hours a week and uh, the person who was uh, working full-time on the project uh, left right before I joined. But uh, some for some of the things, I just went on and tried to uh, come up with uh, algorithms of my own, but uh, I just also found out that they were already partially implemented. So once I figured that out, I just went on improving the algorithm that was there. Uh, but I don't remember of any particular situation where I, I mean, I had to come up with a 
uh, you know, a massive new algorithm. But of course, I have to say still, the every pretty much everything was in its very initial stage, and uh, much of the work was still left to be done, and that was where I just came in. Uh, Nabil, do you have any specific time? Oh, so in, for my case, in my case, I start my project from scratch and build it up, and it was only me. So, um, yeah, when do we get to build a new feature? Whenever it's necessary, one, and you have to show it's it's necessary. Like if we think it's it will provide a good value. You have to like make a small demo, small uh, solution and show it. Then they will approve whoever is in the above you. Then you will implement it in full scale. Or whenever there is a new request from above. So when there is a new request, they will request it and will implement. So those are the two uh, scenarios I see will be build any uh, features. There's a question from Daniel Zellem on soft skills. Soft skills. Oh. Should I look okay. soft skills? Um, which soft soft skills? It might sound a cliche, but communication skills. You have to have a good communication skills um, and good English speaking. You know, so I know most of you are from Ethiopia, from the lists, and others who are n like non, who are non, uh, English or English is not your mother tongue. You have to practice, and like when I was or in my time in Ten Academy, most of the or in the first two months or one hand, one and a half months, uh, I didn't join the stand-up sets frequently and that's the bad thing later on I understand that I should have joined and I should have practiced yeah I don't <laughs> so all that of was you... not a planted it was not a planted statement I just want to say <laughs> yeah so my advice would be don't miss stand-up always join you express your feeling that will help you practice English you know uh, let you let your feelings out and I'm sure you I, I can assure you that people will give you more feedbacks and you can learn from that a lot so yeah don't miss the stand up um, so and Good point. You have, so yeah I agree with Nabil and uh, to add to that I'd say of course there is this understanding this culture that should come uh, naturally to you by this i meant i had the chance to work with both the data science team and the development team so recently we somehow transitioned and what i noticed is that the culture is completely different and uh, you know in the other team there are things that are extremely normal that might get you fired if you have, if you do them in the data science team i'm serious it's i mean it's that different so you'll have to have this uh, you know capability to somehow understand the culture quickly so that you can ace into uh, the environment you're working in but aside from that of course good communication skills are very important i mean you'll have to demonstrate what you have done in an efficient way and uh, you'll have to communicate with your colleagues in an efficient way you'll have to ask for help if you're stuck and you'll have to provide uh, you'll have to be always ready to provide help whenever someone in the team is in need so yeah that having that team mentality and uh, corporate um, creating that cooperative environment will make you succeed i believe thanks and he was joking you will not get get fired 
<laughs> don't just be bold and arrogant because you lose it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like to exaggerate it a bit, but I mean, uh, some things are on direct opposite ends. Okay, let's take it that way. <laughs> so, actually, uh, I'll tell you something right after this, but uh, I think I was right. <laughs> Get something on me or? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, it's like watching a U.S. presidential debate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a random ask. For major user behavior, how do you collect data? How do we collect data? So, you wanna get this? Yeah. Unfortunately, Zellalem left. That's why I don't really want to answer it now. Uh, but I can proceed with the next one since it's uh, to me. So what are the tools you use in pre-processing data and data engineering in general? So actually we're not using those sophisticated tools. We're just for now using uh, Python and uh, some Python modules so that you know, the biggest challenge in data engineering is as the data gets larger and larger, you'll have to uh, optimize so that you're not in short of memory and processing power. So most of the challenges I faced were fixed by just, you know, improving the code and uh, at times just even reducing the data. By reducing the data, I meant Sometimes you'll have to compromise. You reduce the data and uh, you know, push it to the algorithm. Then when, uh, when you're in need of the other data, you just uh, dump or delete the data from memory so that you can get some free memory and then process the other part of the data which you dropped earlier. So these kinds of tricks are what I usually used, but not sophisticated. Uh, tools that are bought or um, installed. So yeah, just just the tools that that can pre-built with uh, a Python. So d honestly, domain knowledge is a lot less relevant. Personally, I think of it that way. I'm trying to answer uh, Blaise, Blaise Papa's question. So I think domain knowledge is of less importance as compared to data science or even ML engineering because uh, you do have a slight idea of, you, you should have an idea of uh, the domain, of course, don't get me wrong on that one, but uh, I think you'll be good even if with a fair amount of domain knowledge, if you're a data engineering uh, as compared to uh, the person who uh, at the end models, um, comes up with a model that will provide the value. So I think for the data analyst and for the data scientist, it's a must have and uh, very crucial. Do we add several results? Yeah. Uh, because in background, we are software engineers, and it's a lot less harder for us to engineer things. And on data engineering, as long as you have a good understanding of engineering things and you know coding some things, uh, you are usually fine. But if you are a statistician or mathematics, a mathematician, and who want to like have this machine learning algorithm knowledge, that may be a challenge. So it depends. So, bottom line, line, bottom line, have some engineering skills and coding skill in Python. Yeah. Oh, it looks like. Uh, is the schedule very tight as Ten Academy? Very interesting question. <laughs> huh, tricky one, huh? But of course, the answer is no, a big no. Uh, is any objections? I mean, it's no. It can't be tight. Mute. Yeah. 
it can be as size as 10 academies. 10 academies, hell, I guess, <laughs> how, how, what number of week are you? So I don't want to discourage anyone here. <laughs> They're finishing, everyone's finishing week eight. Oh, so week eight, you almost say one week, one month. So yeah, 10 academies are hell, as you know. And right. no one can ob object on that. Heaven, heaven, <laughs> did I hear heaven? <laughs> Somewhere in between, <laughs> let's agree with us. <laughs> uh, but I would say, like, you have to win. In, so, um, when you have the work, and don't always focus on the value you gain, like, don't focus on the money, or don't focus on something you gain from like working there. You need, you, you need to, you should be willing to work even nights, you should be willing to work even weekends. I'm not like overwork yourself, but you should be willing to work much harder than everyone else. And get to all the knowledge you can get and don't focus on the value you, you can get now. That will come later. So work harder, that's it. Whatever, wherever you are, yeah. The second one from Barakat. Does the time difference have an effect? How often do you meet with your team? Uh, okay, let me. So, does the time difference have an effect? Yeah, for me, it has huge effect. So, we get in office at like um, 12 or 15 13 in the morning, 15 13 in the morning, and we get out of office at 8. Uh, in the afternoon, and for me, I want to wake up way early in the way early in the morning at like eleven or ten. But with the schedule, I can do that. And you know, I, I don't want, I don't like that. But you have to adjust. So for me, the time difference has, difference has an effect. And how often do you meet with your team? Like we meet every day. We have daily stand up, and we meet. Like we do informal meeting every now and then with different team members, and like you have to help each other, you have to talk when you work in group or together. So, yeah, you meet very often. Yeah, I agree on that one, but uh, personally, for me, uh, it does not have an effect, and I personally even prefer it so. I think it depends on the individual and uh, unless it's uh, going to be in South America or North America, I think pretty much everyone will just get along with it uh, really soon. And uh, to answer Blaze's question, uh, what are some of the code optimization techniques you advise on? So I would say, I'm not saying that you should calculate the big O or the complexity of uh, each uh, function you write, but of course think of it in a high level and think if, it, if there is room for improvement. I'm not saying just dig into it and spend your time in trying to come up with the most efficient one, but of course just keeping it in mind will even you know, improve whatever you write, just trust me on that because uh, Previously, you know, uh, as a student, sometimes we're not concerned about the amount of uh, resources that your program or the code you write takes. This is partly because we're not uh, dealing with a large amount of data. But uh, once I joined at Ludio, uh, I, we came to understand that resources are, should be used efficiently and uh, we are restricted to using 16 gigabytes each so that time when you have that uh, restriction then you learn but of course uh, the techniques are i mean the optimization techniques are different for uh, the different kinds of problems that you might face so what i can suggest here is if you have a good understanding of data structures and algorithms just refer back to them and just keep in mind that there's always a room for improvement and just keep in mind of that when you are writing your code and 
it will not i mean the optimization technique will just flow into your mind because the optimization approach is different for the different problems you might face mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to break things because like you have to know they are broken before you fix it so yeah break stuff and learn yeah <laughs> that's actually a very good point um, and uh, Gabby also likes to tell us this each, each and every day so I think yeah and that helped us a lot and uh, what kind of cultures did you adapt to related to remote working hmm, a good one any ideas Nabil because I have an answer, but I'm afraid that uh, it might not be the angle that you're looking for. So I'll go ahead and answer it in a different way, I guess. So like you need to have remote, it's, it's a remote work and you have to have good internet, um, good working space. No, like there is no office, no one is going to monitor you. So like you have to monitor yourself and discipline and work it work the work when, when it's time and have your rest when it's not time also like you have to discipline yourself what is that and good connection and what other thing i guess that's it yeah. yeah and to add to that it's just about you providing the value this time because in a in a physical office setting you will have uh, you're both sitting right next to you or monitoring you but this time you're just tied to the specific project and you know you, you have to you know that you'll have to get uh, value from that project so I think um, this time when working remotely and when uh, you know that you're you're the one responsible the discipline comes by itself i believe uh, but i had the chance to do an internship two years ago and things were direct opposite and uh, once you get out of the office you'll just forget about the project and you'll just uh, live as if you don't know the project for in the weekends but this time it's a bit different if there is something that needs your attention during the weekends uh, then you'll have to put in the work. So this time it's a bit different uh, because nobody's there to monitor you and the only effective way of monitoring you is the value you provide at the end. So this time uh, I think the discipline will just uh, uh, have its way through your body smoothly. as of time and project submission is it time hmm. so there, there is of course no strict deadline uh, most of the time but of course sometimes there are so let's think of it this way data science work is usually especially if it's research intensive then you might not know ahead of time uh, how, many, how much time it's going to take. And that's a big challenge. So having extremely strict deadlines like the ones there at 10 Academy is not just feasible and it will significantly uh, decrease the, uh, the value that you'll provide or the quality of your work. So we don't have those uh, strict deadlines, but sometimes, and especially since we transitioned to a more development intensive role, whenever there is a client or uh, even if it's not a client but an internal team that's going to be dependent upon the work you provide then I would say the deadlines are even more strict than the ones there at 10 Academy so it depends on who is waiting for your work
Okay, uh, how does the tasks? Mm. So how was the initial interview process when you joined? Okay, so this is a good one. So uh, we were given a challenge first and so first we submitted our resumes and then we had to go through uh, a challenge provided by the company. Then the interview was in just two days after the submission of the challenge, the solution to the challenge. And personally, I would say it uh, tackled three main things. The first one being our soft skills and how we would fit just them evaluating how we would fit in the in the team and the second one is just how how good we are in terms of technical competency so for that one they had uh, questions that they prepared which are of course uh, which don't require domain knowledge and just are generic enough so that anybody from outside can answer them but they're related to most of them are related to data science and the third thing they assessed was our uh, eagerness to learn because this is a an entry label role that we were uh, candidates for so you know at that specific time no one would have all the knowledge in the world so what is crucial there is your eagerness to learn and uh, of course, the, the level of skill that you have at the time is also important. And of course, the, the soft skills and, you know, uh, how you'd feed in the company is also another important matter. So they assessed these three things, basically. Justin, sorry, just for coordination, um, do you, are you guys able to go over or do you have to go to a next thing? No, uh, I think we do have time, right? Okay. So, uh, do you want us to be a lot quicker when answering the questions? No, it's fine. Do I just, just in case, you, I, I'm going to have to drop off, but I think everyone else is here. Yatiana is hosting. So, yeah. okay. please continue. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So Daniel asks, how does the tasks or challenges that you are doing at an academy to the tasks that you are doing in job in terms of intensity, time span, etc. So intensity and time span and all those other things. No, like you are, you guys are doing minimum one week, one month of work in just one week. So you should be proud of that. And you are not just like implementing a thing. You are reporting. You are. I think you are also making some assessment, other things, but you are doing a lot of things. So it doesn't match at all. But still, when you are in work, it's not just you and doing the work. Mostly the work is not defined and there are a lot of parts involved. So it's a long process. It's not like straightforward as you are given these challenges and expected to deliver, to deliver in one week. So in work, there are a lot of parts involved in the process is long, sometimes it's intensive, sometimes it's not, but like to, to, to doesn't much. So to answer your question shortly, no, it's not that intensive, time span, you have longer time, you have longer time to explore, study, do it more efficiently, better. So all those good qualities. Yeah, so I can go on the next one. I think what uh, Abraham's question is, what are the biggest challenges that you faced when you're at Ten Academy? And I'd say it is, of course, adjusting to the massive load uh, of things that we have to do and doing them in such a short amount of time. And of course, uh, you know, I, I am someone who likes to complete everything within the given time frame, and that becomes even more challenging when you have some extracurricular activities. And I mean, uh, 
we had this soft skill sessions of course i know you have them as well and so you know trying to combine those two at the same time is a bit hard because sometimes you have deadlines approaching and you might have uh, very important and uh, you know potentially very valuable sessions right before those deadlines so that was a big compromise and uh, you now that was the biggest challenge but aside from that you know everything is worth it so you know the challenge weren't uh, as big as they should be okay so i'll answer the next one the academy team asked what can you say to bridge the confidence gaps that some of our training might have when they think of starting work on 4th of October 2021 or having interviews in the coming in the coming few weeks? Arun, okay. Okay, what uh, the confidence gap might have? Um, so what can you say? So, so yeah, you guys should know what you have come until now, what you have done until now is not, is a huge thing. You can think that, you can take that as granted with your like current status, whoever gets you, he's way lucky. So you guys should know that, one. Second is, um, and you are, yeah, you are getting all this help how to prepare these resumes, how to like prepare yourself for interview, for the work. You, are, you guys are getting a lot of work from Ten Academy team. So you guys should know you are way more than enough. I guess you are more, capable, you are more way capable of doing anything, whatever comes to your way, you, you, are, yeah, you are capable of doing anything. So have that in mind and yeah, get this thing. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I can completely agree to that. Um, even if, you know, we were also in the same position a year ago and I would say we didn't know where we would sit in the global market. So once we joined this company and of course we had a couple of interviews with other companies as well and, you know, once you have those, of course, you'll know where you stand in the global market. But of course, I understand and I've been in your situation and you might not be certain. But trust me, like Nabil said, what you're going through is not something ordinary and you're extremely capable of uh, providing value to companies right away. I mean, once you join, even if you think that you might not do that in uh, in months, because that's that was also what I thought. But uh, against my belief, both Nabil and I were able to provide value for the company in the first month. I'm not exaggerating that. So um, even if you don't know it now, just trust yourself and push yourself. So that's what I have to say. And uh, the next question is, how are you tackling deadline? And it's from Yerusalem. And so I would say, just thinking about the whole path first, and by the whole path, I mean, listing out the things that you should do, especially if it's uh, a long task, just breaking them down and listing them. So assigning time for each one of them, of course, uh, we used trailer boards at first. Now we shifted to Jira. So we have this way of uh, story pointing or giving weights to tasks so that the weights correspond to uh, the time they take. So from that, you will have an idea of whether it's feasible to complete the task in time or not. So if, the, if it's not feasible, then you'll have to uh, put in more effort or even more resources. Uh, it might be an additional teammate or even a computational power. So I think that's how we tackle it. But uh, if 
that's not answered well, make sure you raise it again. So what do you use ideally for Python? Do you work on the cloud? Let me please answer this one, Nabil. I, I know you, it's your turn, but so this one, uh, I'm a big fan of PyCharm and I believe everybody should try PyCharm right before doing uh, right before trying anything out, please. But uh, Nabil has different ideas. But PyCharm makes everything easy. Yeah, that's oh, your plain, so I'm not going so hard on you. But PyCharm, I don't like PyCharm. Don't use IDE. You can use text editor or you know just use text editor. Python doesn't really need IDE in my opinion. So you can use just base code is good, or you are more guru or geeky, you can even use Emacs or Vim. So especially when you work on the cloud, you access your cluster or notebooks with SSH. So like notebook, Jupyter notebook is not a suitable environment for me to work. So usually, not usually, I'm still, amateur user but i use vim so try like have this habit of using the terminal so try vim try emacs explore don't uh, really stuck with the gui things or those programs that has a uh, user interface so yeah try text editor and terminal editors i guess vim and emacs yeah yeah so to answer the next one, anything good you did or think you should have done during your time at Ten Academy? So uh, anything good we did, I believe, is the last project, which had a two-week span. And it, it was an end-to-end -end research on uh, the impact of COVID-19 on different things. And I say, even if we didn't have the time that the project requires, I believe we've delivered a good enough thing and we have um, put in all the effort and, you know, that has boosted our confidence. But uh, to answer the second part of the question you think you should have done in Attain Academy is, I would say, we didn't have the luxury of learning MLOps and uh, tools like uh, CircleCI, uh, unlike you guys. So. I would have loved it if we had done those uh, uh, during my time at Ten Academy. So you guys, I think, are lucky in that regard because uh, you're tackling pretty much everything that the industry requires. I would say like a couple of points. I already said it. So I, I, I wish I would have joined the stand up more. So. You guys should uh, attend the stand up more. And second, I don't know if you guys have the in sessions. I think those are non technical classes. But if you have, great, join those sessions. They are important. Like they will give you a lot of uh, lessons. Or if you don't have, you can go back in YouTube. You can watch from our batch. All the sessions are recorded. And so just search non technical or so. So yeah, you can get it from there and watch that. And like one thing I get from that non-technical session is, so he told us our first aim or our, our priority in job should be making our boss happy. Like everything else comes second. Everything like making your work in the best way you can, you could do it or whatever else that come that can come next, your main priority should be making your boss happy. And how do you make your boss happy? Usually it's by doing a great job, but yeah, there are other things also. So that's one thing I want to, you guys know. I think uh, how much harder is it if one of you were placed in this job alone? I think, Fortunately for us, people we are working on uh, with are extremely welcoming and I would say 
uh, we would still be in a really good environment. So I don't think it's going to be uh, extremely hard, but of course uh, it helps so much to have um, people you know, people that care for you uh, on your side. So of course it will make a difference, but still I would say we would still succeed uh, without much trouble. Okay, the second question is from yourself. Do you notice a repetitive pattern in your tasks during your job, or are there fresh challenges every day, 15 months as a knowledge or any perspective? So, usually, or for me in my home, we start in this project and we maintain the project. So, it's not new things every time, but also it's not the same thing. It's not a pretty deep. Um, so, yeah, there is a feature that's want to be implemented. You have to come to the solution, you implement it. And that feature might be, or the, like the path you follow might repeat for other scenario, or you, you might have to like, do a new feature, uh, create, come up with a new solution and implement a new feature. So both, but usually, until now, for me, it's mostly new features and sometimes it's repetitive. But yeah, you will face both. Yeah. And uh, the next one is uh, before joining and enrolling at Ten Academy, did you have the whole data engineering, data science as your career path? Um, yes, I was personally, for me, I was making the transition to data science even before um, ten, uh, I knew Ten Academy. But of course, uh, Ten Academy cemented that I would uh, continue as a data scientist. Uh, but of course, within data science, you might even be a data engineer, an ML ops uh, engineer, or even a machine learning engineer. So I didn't narrow it down uh, even during my time at Ten Academy. But of course, once I was placed in the job, I think I'm more of a data engineer at the moment. But yeah, I think having all of those and uh, you know becoming as, uh, as versatile as you can be at this time, especially when looking for a, an entry level job is crucial. I just, even if it's not part of the question, I just wanted to stress that out. So thanks. Go ahead, Nabil. Yeah, so I just want to point out, so some of you might, so for me, I never thought I would become a scientist or data engineer. I never thought I would end up here. So maybe in the last year of when I was in college in the last year, so I joined Ten Academy and that ships everything for me. So. Those of you who are new to the science, data science, science or data engineering, and who just been introduced by it, Sultan Academy, yeah, there's a huge, huge opportunity to for you to become a good data science, data engineering, and develops. So, yeah, just want to highlight that. And the next question, uh, trying, where were we? Station, station, okay. If you didn't mind, if you don't mind this, what is the range of uh, starting salary in your city. Well, I don't mind, but I can't disclose that. So I'm just going to move to the next one. <laughs> but nice try. <laughs> uh, which is from your experience with space for uh, science purpose? For me, I would say Linux, because most, most of you can access Linux. It's cheaper than Mac, and you can access Linux. The reason why, um, so you, you have the luxury of using the bash or the terminal. In, in Windows, you don't have that luxury. And a lot of things are like addition. You feel like they are a plugin on top of Windows and they don't work snappy, they don't work fluent, uh, efficiently. So mostly they don't even work. So yeah, Linux. Yeah, I'd also like to stress on that because 
I was also, you know, a big fan of Windows and I was a Windows user during my time at Ten Academy. And I was pretty much stubborn when Nabil told me to, to make a switch to uh, Linux. But, you know, it, I was forced to. And I think uh, most of you will do, even if you're a Windows fan, because most of the things that you will work on are much better supported by a Unix environment. And uh, of course, if you can, uh, if you have a Mac, that would be really great. But if not, I think switching to Ubuntu is an ideal solution. Um, so, how does one ask a good question? So, so I think, yeah, to ask a good question, of course, the most important thing is understanding the whole situation. So. I think it all comes down to listening first. And if you pay all the attention and as the person is speaking, if you can come up with uh, a solution, trying, I mean, you're not going to come up with the solution, but if you try to come up with the solution as the person is speaking of the situation, then of course you'll have a, ver a better picture and you can have, you can come up with a wonderful question uh, that even the person who is speaking might not have, so uh, might have thought of. So I think that's uh, the best approach. Um, so you can go with the next one, Nabil. Okay, so, you know, TCI for a person who is not confident with his skills, what do you recommend? It is intensively and apply or apply get a job? and read while working or oh, okay. read while working <laughs> so he's not confident in their skill right now i mean that's natural right especially if you have no prior knowledge of that science or these fields prior to 10 academies that's natural to have and um like one you should know you get way lot of knowledge from 10 academy and two still if you are not confident what you do, you just read, go and read, go and look up uh, materials, practice, go to Kaggle if you want to like, if you want to intensively apply, um, focus on email engineering. And there are even other resources, go and read and build yourself up. And like for the next one, reading while working, like I want to um, intensively highlight on this because it's not so before i um joined adultio i thought yeah i can work and i have i will have some time spare time and i will read on those time but what turns out is it's a lot harder to study and read while you have work so like i don't want to discourage you that you have work and you can't study but it's it's usually harder than you thought so yeah try to get all the knowledge you can get before joining your work and when you want, once you get work if you have a good discipline you still get you still can read and get more knowledge but it's usually harder to like read on your own while you have work so yeah yeah so to answer the next one i think for the technical I think it all depends on what you'll be working on, but I would say, of course, getting really comfortable with Python. I know this is a generic answer and I honestly cannot make it more specific because it depends on the work that you'll do. But of course, making yourself extremely comfortable with Python uh, will uh, make your way really easier. But of course, if you are going to be deployed in a modeling and statistic in statistics intensive job, then I would say the relevance of Python might decrease. But I think Python uh, and you know investing your time in becoming more comfortable with Python is very essential. And of course, for the non-technical, I would say it's of course still communi communication. You'll have to be able to understand the, the culture really quickly and be able to communicate in an efficient manner. So that's one for 
technical and non-technical. So go ahead, Nabil. Okay. Mikael has asked, are you guys working remotely? If yes, how has that affected your productivity and professional development? Yeah, we are working remotely. So how's that, how's that, how does that affect our productivity and so productivity? Um, so it depends on how much effort you put on, but still, so like my only work experience is through remote. This is my first, first job. So I don't know what's on the other side, like when you work in person. But in my opinion, we are still efficient. That doesn't really affect our productivity. Even I think it decreased, decreased it because right, we are in a suitable environment. We have a good connection. Um, working remotely doesn't pro prevent us from connecting with the other employees. We have meeting regularly, so yeah, that doesn't really affect our productivity negatively. If so, it should be positively. And professional development, um, so it's just a work, whether it's remote or you go in office and work in person, it's just a work. So as long as you work good, your professional development should go up. So for me, those two things, doesn't have any difference when it, comes, when it comes to professional development. Mm, okay, so how do you manage? No, so we're, uh, we have a workspace here and pretty much it's reliable 24 seven. I would say it's 99% of the time uh, reliable. So we, didn't need to be concerned about power disruption or even internet for that matter. And looks like uh, those are all the questions. Mm. Yeah, really, if no one has any more questions. <laughs> <Very little. laughs> um. Mahi, do we have any directions? You're welcome, Danny. Daniel Zalan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I see uh, we the Ten Academy team. Where are they? Speak up, Ten Academy team. Mahalit is there. Somehow. Yeah. Well, hello. Hey, hey. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? We're great. So we're lucky to have you here in this standard. Thank you. We're yeah. very Thank honored. you very much. You have shared that a lot. Thank you. The honor is ours. Thank you for joining yeah. us. OK. Hi, Namil. This is here, Tiana. Hi. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Hi, yeah, so I, I'm the community manager and I've just been here in the background, you know, allowing you guys to chat with the trainings and it's been um, wonderful. So I don't know if there is any, okay, yeah, so if you could share your LinkedIn profiles, okay, in the chat box, that would be absolutely lovely if that is something that you would want to do so that they could connect with you, okay? So um, I don't know if we have any more questions for Yes, I have one. Oh, okay, okay. Manet has one. So how do you manage this cultural difference between us and the rest of your team? Yeah, very exciting question. It, Nabil, can you mute? Oh, sorry. So... I don't think there is a rule for that, unfortunately, but of course, trying to pay your attention as much as you can. And, you know, uh, I would say trying to remain uh, silent for the, uh, I mean, this is just a personal recommendation. Uh, it may not be the- Yeah, it's just from your experience. Yeah. yeah, but from, yeah, thank you. From my experience, I would say it's just, 
try to play safe at first in the first days and of course uh, try to observe how different people interact with each other for the first couple of days just you know speak only when uh, you are directly you know asked something for a specific thing but of course this, this may not be the ideal solution but personally i think once you know how everybody interacts with with each other you will identify what's uh, normal to say and what's better avoided so yeah i think it's just observing it giving it a couple of days thank you very much now Nabil, can you add, sir? Yes. Um, for you, the working uh, solution or best solution for you? Sorry, I didn't get the question. I was searching my LinkedIn profile. Can you repeat? Sorry. How do you manage the cultural difference between you and your team? Cultural difference. So. Suppose we have time difference, uh, there is a lot out there, yeah. uh, apart so, from the work. How do you manage that? Time difference is not something like it's not exact. There's no exaggeration time difference. So, still, as I said, I would have liked it for it to be more like our time, but it's not, and it's not that much difference. Time difference. So, I mean, that can be adjustable easily. But other than that, other cultural difference. I suppose, like when you first, you observe people and you ask what they do, uh, what why they do what they do, or what's okay or what, what's not okay. And over time, you know, you will get along with people and they will be more open to you. So it will come naturally, I guess. So don't be fast to, to do things. Or ask people if it's okay to do it or not. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so um, I do not think we have any other questions from the trainees, but I really want to say a very big thank you to Nahum and Nebio because this has been a very, very engaging session. And um, I am sure you have boosted the confidence of a lot of trainees present here. You know, you've given them some clarity because you're actually working in the industry and you were where they are right now last year. So um, coming from you, I'm sure that they are going to take everything that you've said and just become more confident and more knowledgeable. So um, we want to say a big thank you. Does anyone from the Batch 4 training who wants to unmute and personally just say a big thank you on behalf of the 10 academic team? Anyone who wants to just unmute themselves and just say a big thank you to Nabil and Nehom? <laughs> Nabil is waiting for Nehom is also waiting. Okay, Jackie, now go ahead. Uh, uh, uh. I'd like to say thank you very much. Actually, the, the session has been very uh, informative. And also thank you for, we are enjoying uh, the benefits uh, that you guys are paying for, because uh, I understand that uh, from you guys, that's, you're the guys who've ma actually made this possible through paying for uh, the training now that you're in work. So I'd also like to say thank you for that. and. Uh, Thank you for the encouragement because uh, most of the questions uh, on the chat uh, really apply to me. So yeah, thank you. And I'm looking forward to connecting with you more on uh, LinkedIn and stuff. Thank you for that. We'll be looking forward to it. Yeah. Thank you guys for having us. Um, so yeah, it was a lovely session. It was amazing. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much, and um, wishing you guys all the best in your endeavors. Okay. And um, yeah, have a good one, guys. You too. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 <laughs>